This morning, I'd like you to rise for the reading of God's Word. You can follow along on the screen. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand it. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood, and read along with me. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Masai. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Milkajai, Hashem, Hashpadanani, Zechariah, and Meshalem. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The people listened to God. They worshiped. They celebrated. And I considered making this an experiential sermon and having you stand for the next 25 minutes. But my middle school children thought differently, and they would like for you to sit. So you may be seated. I want to put this passage in Nehemiah 8 in parallel with the Berean church as recorded in Acts 17. Some 500 years after Nehemiah, Luke writes, Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. And now I ask, is our community like Nehemiah 8 or Acts 17? Are we like that? Since God's stories includes you and I, is our FBCG community, are we addicted to the reading of God's word? This is where I'm landing the plane this morning. I'm, getting the, I'm giving you the conclusion as the introduction. I want, to turn, I want you to turn that burner on. I'm going to add the heat, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring it to a boil this morning. Some of us don't even know if this biblical character, Ezra, is a man or a woman. Ezra is a man. Ezra is the author of the book of Ezra, and the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were actually a box set, you could sort of say. Before the third century, Ezra actually included Nehemiah as its second half. But in a summer where we've been studying Nehemiah for about 10 weeks now, today we, we must pause to identify who the man Ezra is in this story. He was an Old Testament equivalent of a pastor teacher. Basically, a, a pastor Jeff, just a little bit shorter perhaps. 13 years earlier, he had led the return from Persia to rebuild the temple and to teach the law of God. He saturated himself in the word of God. He prepared his own heart to seek the word. Then he practiced it himself, and then he taught it to God's people. His knowledge of the law of God gave him the ability to instruct others and in how to apply it to their lives and apply the Bible to their lives. There was a lack of Levites in that community, and because of that, these men of understanding were used to assist the people at understanding the law and act upon its precepts. And finally, the last point I'd like to make is regarding his spiritual life, Ezra's. In seven out of the 11 references to Ezra in the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, God's people gathered together, and Ezra was the focus of their attention but it was the focus because he was speaking to them about his and their God. The effect of the life and the ministry of a pastor teacher in any assembly is to unite the saints to the Lord and to stir them into intimacy with God. The reading of the word came from the desire of the people, not Ezra. Ezra was asked to read because he had knowledge as a student of the word of God. 
Let me put a little spin on my understanding of Ezra. Two weeks ago, my dear friend, Pastor Sterling, brought the morning message. And I was doing the cafe leadership because Sterling was on video. So I was there to do the announcements, the greeting, and even the benediction. And uniquely, Pastor Sterling wrote the benediction for me in the cafe, which is where he shepherds that community. He's there every week. So I arose to do the benediction that morning, but before I did that, I told the people that Sterling is a little bit more special than the average Joe because I know how intimately he loves that community and I know how authentic his life and ministry is. And that made it special for me and I believe that's what makes it special for that community. Sure, we could listen to amazing preachers on YouTube or on iTunes, but the impact of Sterling that morning was powerful because he was our Ezra. He is our Ezra. And our pastors and our preachers, they're a gift to FBCG because they're real. They're authentic. They're not just great orators. They share their lives with us, and it's real. So let's look at these verses together and pull the truths that will inspire us and convict us of what it means to delight in the hearing of God's word. The audience consisted of men, women, and all with understanding. And I can't help but as the pastor of family and serving to look at this verse 1. Verse 1 indicates that the celebration and the reading of the word was done by who? All. That means everyone. It means all together. This seems to indicate that they didn't have their children and middle school and high school students meeting away from the gathering, doing food and games, crowd bakers, and other various things. I'm just saying, it's a great advertisement that for the next three weeks, all of those students will be in our midst because for three weeks, we don't have Sunday school. And so you're all welcome to be in community. Three weeks ago, my family and I were on vacation and I attended a worship service. So yes, pastors do go to worship when they're on vacation. That, that worship community was both clear and bold to those in attendance with this statement. It was for adults only. Even in the bulletin, it indicated that kids under six years old were, were actually not welcome. And I don't know about you, but if I was older than six, why would I want to come back? I wouldn't feel that welcome. Ultimately, I believe it's why our faith at home target here at First Baptist is becoming a priority because we all finish children and student ministries and we spend decades worshiping together in a multi-generational experience. So it's why we want to put a target on worshiping together. God created the church, and he often refers it to a family, doesn't he? Why would a family go to a party and then end up choosing to be fragmented or split up? I mentioned that I took my family on a vacation recently. Let me tell you what our family did not do. It was not all four of us going on a trip and then doing four separate excursions. It was all of us experiencing shared community, being with one another. Now, granted, we chose to be on a 40-foot sport fish in the Bahamas, so we couldn't really get away from one another, but it was our focus to be with one another. And I'm just getting started because the verses in Nehemiah that we're going to look at illustrate that the hearing of the word is marked by patience. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of men, women, and others who could understand. This picture is taken of a sunrise in Geneva, and that sun arose at 5.55 this morning. This would have translated into nearly six hours of scripture reading, making me wonder, would five-hour energy need to be available at our coffee and donut bar? Might we need no dose next to those pens in front of you in that seat right there? I'm just saying. Honestly, there wouldn't be a clock at the back, and we wouldn't be concerned about a noon kickoff here this fall, would we? Additionally, there's no invitation sent out for this gathering. No public notice was given. People were hungry for the answers to their problems, and they used the word of God as their guideline. Notice that this hunger for God's word was also spontaneous. It had a characteristic of what I would say would be a revival. And 19 years ago, I was a grad student at Wheaton College in 1995 when revival broke out on that campus. 
And I say I was fortunate because the reading of God's word in the public confession of sin got my attention. Got my attention. And friends, the hearing of God's word is marked by attention. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Interesting to note, there is no word in Hebrew that means attentive. However, the meaning is actually quite perfect because it's translated, the ears of all the people were to the book. I love that. The ears of all the people were toward the book. They listened from daybreak until noon. And certainly their long attention span indicates how deeply they were aware of their ignorance about life and how much they needed the answers from the Lord God. They were simply crying out for the word of God. As a freshman in high school, we had a science teacher that was a first year teacher that year. And let's just say our first period science class was not too sensitive to the fact that this woman was not a morning person. Uh, and there was a morning due to our unruliness that Miss Brannigan had issued a decree that anyone who spoke or made any noise would be immediately sent to the dean. Well, let's just say we had a problem that morning because I'm sitting there right next to my lab partner named Eddie, and Eddie looked up at her, and he looked above her, and there was a clock on the wall, you know those school clocks? And he said to me, he goes, that clock is going to fall on her head. And in my attempt to get her attention, I began to speak just as the time that big old school clock came crashing down onto her head. And I'm not kidding you. I violated the talking rule. She got bonked on the head. Her reaction was not only tears, but my immediate rejection or dismissal from the classroom to the dean. And I'm not kidding you. There was no grace in this woman's life at that time. Yet, it was very easy to talk to that dean and give him my side of the story to get out of that consequence. But the reason I'm telling you this story is that when a rabbi speaks and uses the word of God and he reads it, it is unlawful to speak about anything. Not even con you couldn't even speak about the word of God at the time. Silence was necessary when the Bible was read. The attention given to the reading of the word would have been greater than that of those British Royal Guards. Who's been there? If you've been there, what do you try to do to those guys? You try to make them blink or smile, and the attention is magnificent. And that's the type of attention we have for the Word of God. Before the next mark of hearing the Word of God, my question to our community is, do you listen attentively? Do you really listen attentively? I've shared two marks of the reading of God's Word but let me push pause and highlight this verse 4. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood 13 of his peers, on his right and on his left. Notice I'm not reading them all over again. That was a challenge enough. But the point of what I'm saying is Ezra is not alone. There is a cadre of leadership surrounding him while he reads the word of God. And similar to Exodus 17, when Moses' hands were being held up, by Aaron and Hur, so that Joshua could beat the Amalekites. This is a fabulous reminder that the Christian journey is not to be an individual one. Each one of us ought not to be struggling in our faith alone or even reading God's word alone. Ezra is surrounded, and he models this, Ezra is surrounded by his peers. And FBCG, I want to invite you to make a decision this August to sign up for a ministry a C group, an adult learning community, a Sunday school class, perhaps even Bible study fellowship, to join others in reading and studying God's word. I challenge you to do that right this month. Make a commitment to be in a community that studies God's word. But back to the marks of listening to God's word. If we were all gathered at the United Center and we began to hear this, If we began to hear this, what would you do right about now? At least when the music started to change, we would all rise, wouldn't we? We would all rise if we were at the United Center. And the hearing of the word is marked by reverence. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. When I was in sixth grade, my family moved from Philadelphia to Florida 
and I was enrolled in a private prep school. There were uniforms, there was a headmaster rather than a principal, there were traditions, and then there were rules. Different types of rules, private school rules. And the one that caught me off guard the most was whenever an adult entered a classroom, all the students would rise. I was always the last one to rise. It was hard to get me used to these private school rules. I'd never been taught to rise when an elder entered the room. When the people stand at the reading of the Torah, it is a mark of reverence for the Word of God. This is a proper custom for the people of God to follow. And this morning, I asked each of you to rise in order to physically be aware of those who had just been spending 52 days building the wall, now they stood in reverence for the word of God for how many hours? Five. And yet the fourth mark of hearing the word of God is worship. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen and amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I've taught people how to use their hand for prayer for decades. First, we praise God, thumbs up. Then we thank God for things. Then, yep, it's the middle finger. We confess our sins. I won't go into that. Then there's the ring finger. We pray for others. And if you're still awake, this is the international symbol for I. And I say awake because a lot of people fall asleep when they pray. But now you pray for yourself. But since prayer is a conversation, it's not just talking, you take all of them and you pull them back here and you listen. It's a great method for prayer, but what I love about the method is that the focus of prayer is also on praise. It is the reflecting and worshiping on our great God. And Ezra models this for the Israelite community. In this moment, blessing and praise are directed to Yahweh, the giver of the word. Doesn't this teach us that the study of scripture ought not to slip into mere intellectual study or the word being read as simply a novel? but it must be mixed with praise and worship and thanksgiving. Then they bow down and they worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. They stand, they speak, and now they kneel. Well, I grew up outside of the Baptist tradition, and we didn't get all that much right in our Baptist, outside of our Baptist tradition, I'll be honest with you. But what I loved about that tradition, reflecting back on it, is they had kneelers. And I love the kneelers. I think back of last weekend when we celebrated the Lord's Supper, and in that tradition, I would kneel holding the elements in my hands. And it's encouraged me to consider my own posture when I reflect on the holiness of God. So after these marks of reading God's word, we discover from verses seven and eight of how important it is to understand the word of God. The Levites instructed the people of the law, in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that people understood what was being read. These Levites circulated among the crowd, perhaps doing the exposition of the word in small groups. I love the image of that, how, how many people would have been forming in small groups and then having little individual instructors. Their intent was to make the word of God clear, to highlight the insight it holds and to make its applications obvious. It is what any person would do for another who is new to the word or unclear with how to bring one's life into alignment with its precepts. And yet this hunger or attraction has been happening throughout history. I mentioned the church in Berea 500 years later, the revival at Wheaton in 1995, and then there are many examples how the church of Jesus Christ is thriving amongst underground house churches in unreached countries around the world. Just this past Sunday, I met with a man that is doing ministry through sports in North Korea and then in 29 other closed countries where you get arrested for saying the word Jesus. And then I met on Tuesday with a man from Converge, our affiliation, who celebrated a church planner that has planted 200 churches since January of 2014. That to me is unbelievable. Yet people are actually starving for the answers to the problems of life. And as I've begun to travel over these past few years to visit some of our missionaries in various countries, I continue to find a deep hunger amongst people to listen to the word of God. Whatever is taught with any degree of understanding, they're immediately attracted to it. Just this past December, right before it got crazy in the Ukraine, I visited Elise West to do research on this year's Serve the World partner Stephen's house. And I was there listening to a Ukrainian pastor named Victor there in the 
in the center there, more or less, the guy that looks Ukrainian. And uh, he was preaching, and I understood absolutely nothing. It was said in, it was all spoken in a foreign language. Yet it was so rich to listen and to watch both Victor and his congregation listen and consume the Word of God. You see, when the Word of God is opened up, people begin to understand themselves. When you know God, you begin to understand yourself because you've been created in the image of God. And these people in Jerusalem were soon growing in self-knowledge as they began to hunger for God's Word. Some of you know that I've been a student of prayer in this year of 2014 because, quite frankly, I realized I didn't do a lot of it. And I'd like to pause just very briefly and ask you to pray with me a short breath prayer. It'll be on the screen. You pray it in your heart. Lord, create in us a hunger for your word. Forgive us for so often taking it for granted. Amen. Note that every time you open your Bible to read and study, you have an encounter with the living God. What's happening here is that you are consuming the word of God, and that is essential for the people of God. We consume the word in our own private devotional life in our study time. We read it, we memorize it, we meditate on it, we study it, and we share it with others. Jesus said to his disciples, if you continue in my word, then you truly are my disciples. The word plays a big part of our lives together. This fall, we will witness this in the life of the early church as pastors Brian and Jeff do a study on the book of Acts for many weeks. And the church of Acts understood this. In chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship of the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The apostles' teaching is the essence of what we have in our New Testament. Our New Testament is the apostolic witness that is passed from the apostles of Jesus to the churches in the New Testament and now conveyed to us through the scriptures in the New Testament. Paul challenged his good friend Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Why? Well, because not everyone had a copy of the scriptures. Today, most of us have several Bibles around our homes. The American Bible Society says that 88% of Americans have a copy of the scriptures. They even have identified that 4.7 copies exist in a home in America today. However, in those days, that was not the case. They were to, if they were to consume the word of God, they needed it read publicly. There's power in the word of God. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. God uses it to cut through all the clutter in our lives to get what he is wanting us to do in our lives. So we see that the people of God are gathered together to attentively listen to one man read the word of God. The word of God is being consumed. Yet there's power. It's the truth and nothing but the truth. It is the truth which searches the deepest parts and places and cleanses you so that there's nothing left bad inside of you. It really cuts you to pieces when you have sin residing in you. It's what the word of God says in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Friends, if you listen to the word of God and it doesn't cut you to the core, think again. Read it again. The word of God changes you day in and day out. Once you accept it, it begins to purify you. If it doesn't cut you to core, it either means that the preacher's not doing his job or you've become deaf or blind to the word of God. God's word when preached does not make you feel good. Let me say that again. God's word when preached does not make you feel good. It makes you feel good only when you have obeyed it and done what it says. I love James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. It makes you feel good only when you change the ways, your ways, after hearing the word of God. It makes you feel good only when you understand the depth and truth written in its pages. It makes you feel good only when you take every word seriously and apply your life to it and see that you have wrong things and start to change them. It's the reality of John 8:32. The truth sets you free. If you're rejoicing when the truth cuts you to the core, 
then you're in a good place. I would argue you're in a great place. But not everyone here this morning is in that place. So I got a question. Do you feel a need for personal spiritual renewal in your life? Is your time with scripture and in prayer limited by too busy schedules or even too many helpful appointments? Nehemiah's story is both personal and also far-reaching. He must have often read in the Psalms about his restorer God. Psalm 80, the author writes three times, Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. God does let his face shine upon his people, and he's ready to do it again. 